Uh, I'd like to introduce now uh, our uh, keynote speaker for this morning, uh, Tom Countryman. Uh, Tom has served in the State Department's Office of Counterterrorism, and he was the advisor to Ambassador Albright on Middle East affairs in the U.S. mission to the United Nations. From 2005 to 2008, he was the Deputy Chief of Mission in the U.S. Embassy in Athens, Greece, and for a five-month period in 2007, he served as Charged Affairs. Since September 2010, he has served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, supervising the Office of South Central European Affairs, and is responsible for U.S. relations with the West Balkan countries. He is fluent in Serbo-Croatian and proficient in Arabic, Italian, Greek, and German, and I hope that he'll put Macedonian soon on the list. <laughs> with all further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. Countryman. Dobro utro. And thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's both an honor and a pleasure for me to be here today at the third annual com global conference of the United Macedonian Diaspora and to salute everything that you do, the energy you put into building a stronger bridge between the Republic of Macedonia and the United States and other friends around the world in your new home countries. As a friend and a partner, the United States has stood beside the Republic of Macedonia since its independence, helping to strengthen its multi-ethnic democracy and its market economy, and assisting in its progress towards our shared goal of its full integration into Euro-Atlantic institutions. Thanks to the hard work of its people, and with strong support from you in the diaspora, Macedonia has come a very long way. And today the partnership between the United States and Macedonia has never been closer. We appreciate the constructive role that Macedonia is taking both regionally and globally. To highlight just a few facets of our deepening cooperation, we're working together in the region of Southeast Europe we work together as Adriatic Charter partners towards Macedonia's NATO membership. And we work closely together through multilateral institutions like the United Nations and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And most significantly, Macedonian and U.S. soldiers are today serving bravely together in Afghanistan. These are significant contributions that Macedonia is making, and the United States is grateful for these contributions. We remain committed to seeing Macedonia in both NATO and the European Union. To achieve this, however, there are still a number of significant challenges that the Macedonian government must recognize and must work to overcome. The most obvious of these challenges, if not necessarily the most significant, is the long-standing name dispute with Greece. It seems unfair that the process of Macedonia's Euro-Atlantic integration <clears throat> is tied so closely to this emotional issue. Fair or unfair, however, the reality of this linkage is inescapable and we must deal with the world as it is. Failure to resolve this issue hurts Macedonia. It prevents Macedonia from achieving its rightful place in NATO and the European Union, and the time to resolve it is right now. Resolving this issue is also important to Macedonia's long-term political stability. Euro-Atlantic integration will give all Macedonians the confidence, the respect, the recognition, as well as the voice and the seat at the international table 
to help make Macedonia and the entire region more stable and more prosperous in the 21st century. Prime Ministers Gruevsky and Papandreou over the last two years have met privately, confidentially, and respectfully to discuss this matter and met again yesterday in Brussels. This respectful, confidential contact is what was missing for many years. That it is now evident is a very welcome step forward. These meetings that the two demonstrate that the two parties can work together without hand-holding from the United States or other parties. I believe that these two prime ministers have the vision and the standing to agree on a mutually acceptable solution. We recognize that there's no easy solution to this dispute. There's no scenario in which either side can get a solution they feel is historically accurate or a solution that is politically desirable. It will require compromise from both parties. Compromise is not easy when you are convinced of the rightness of your cause, but it demonstrates national qualities of maturity and self-confidence. It's often dissatisfying to compromise, even painful, but I believe that the political pain will be temporary. Perhaps this pain will be felt more keenly by you in the diaspora than by Macedonians living in Macedonia. It's easier to hold on to an absolute uncompromising position from a distance, but citizens in both of these countries are eager today for a more normal relationship. So the time for a resolution, as I said, is now. Macedonia has just had successful elections praised by the OSCE Election Observation Unit, and a new government will be formed soon. The political parties in the Republic of Macedonia have enough other issues to address without the distracting siren song of nationalism. I can assure you that the United States will not encourage the government of Macedonia to accept a solution that threatens the sovereignty, territorial integrity, or the identity of the state and its citizens. I'm eager to see a solution now, not only because we want to see Macedonia in NATO, but because it would also advance Macedonia's integration into the European Union. The EU integration process is not just bureaucratic. It is a process that improves the daily lives of the citizens of the state. The integration process is an engine that drives reforms. Not moving forward in this process today is slowing reforms in Macedonia. Independently of the name dispute, there are worrisome indications that Macedonia is losing momentum in the process of EU accession. There's been no recent progress, and in fact, some regression in important areas like rule of law, the independent judiciary, the fight against corruption, and the independence of the media. The elections are over and we expect a new government in whatever form it takes to rededicate itself to these reforms. The new government needs to recognize that reform is not an issue for only one party to decide. Genuine reform requires public debate, including with civil society, on the goals and on the legislation. It requires cooperation with the opposition, to work toward a consensus on the building of independent state institutions. And it requires consultation with the European Union and other friends to ensure that those reforms meet the European standards. For too many years, political leaders in the Balkans have seemed to believe 
that victory in a democratic election gives the winner the right to control not only the parliament, not only the ministries, but also the judiciary, the police, the intelligence service, the media, major industries, and other institutions. Croatia made a strategic decision in 2004 to leave this model behind. As a result, today Croatia is on the very doorstep of European Union membership. Macedonia and all of its neighbors need to make the same decision. And the citizens need to demand that the political parties respect the independence of these institutions. This year is the 10th anniversary of the signing of the Ohrid Framework Agreement, which ended an ethnic conflict that threatened Macedonia's very existence. Unfortunately, the agreement has not yet been fully embraced or consistently implemented. Macedonia is a multi-ethnic society, like all of its neighbors. And like its neighbors, if Macedonia is to be successful and to join the European Union, it must have a political model that provides equal political rights for its citizens of all ethnicities. It must have a model that gives all communities a reason to be proud to be citizens of Macedonia. At a crisis point in Macedonia's history, the Ohrid Framework Agreement salvaged the vision of multi-ethnic comity, and it enabled the country to move forward. That is what the Ohrid Framework Agreement was about and still is about. It's no less relevant today than it was in 2001. The Macedonian government and citizens need to rededicate themselves to the agreement in both letter and spirit. There is no NATO member that will be happier than the United States to see Macedonia become a member of NATO. With the next NATO summit to be held next year in the United States, in the beautiful city of Chicago, membership would be an historic milestone for Macedonia. I want so much to look forward to that handshake between President Obama and a Macedonian leader, not just as partners, but as full allies. Remember, please, that membership in NATO should not be viewed as just another achievement or another medal to wear or another flag to fly. It's a commitment that carries with it many responsibilities and obligations. The newest members of NATO, Croatia and Albania, have taken on these serious responsibilities. And I'm happy that Macedonia has also begun to demonstrate its readiness and its seriousness of purpose. Last year brought an unprecedented joint deployment of Macedonian soldiers with the Vermont National Guard. It has one of the highest per capita troop contributors to the international security force in Afghanistan, and we wish the Macedonian contingent continued success, and we pray for their safety. The U.S. puts the greatest importance in this region on having a partner like Macedonia and seeing Macedonia succeed as a European 21st century state. We look forward to an ever stronger partnership in the future, working together to advance Macedonia's own internal transformation on the path to full Euro-Atlantic integration and cementing a democratic, secure, and prosperous future for both of our peoples. Thank you very much for your attention.